Hi there, I'm Stuart Ralston, Chairman of uh, the Paget's Disease Association, and uh, it's my pleasure to give a, a brief update on the medical treatment of Paget's disease uh, for the um, information day we're having uh, in York. So um, Paget's disease is uh, still quite a common condition in the UK, recognised to affect about 1% of people over the age of 55. The problem with Paget's disease is that there are abnormalities of bone remodelling. And uh, as discussed by my colleague, uh, Dr. Anna Darazeska in the, the lecture previous to this, and these abnormalities can cause various complications to occur. They can cause pain. They can cause the bones to be bent, as shown in, in this part of the slide here. And they can also cause fractures as well as other complications. However, many patients with Paget's disease have no symptoms at all. We still don't quite understand what determines who gets symptoms and who does not. Now, um, this was a study which my colleague and I, Adrian Tan, did um, a number of years ago, about uh, eight, um, yeah, seven or eight years ago, looking at the symptoms that patients presented with when they first came to our clinic. Um, in fact, pain was the most common symptom. 73% of patients had pain, but about 17% had deformity, about 25% had signs of osteoarthritis or wear and tear arthritis, about 5% had a fracture, about 7% had deafness. But about 20% actually had no symptoms when the condition was picked up uh, as an incidental finding, often because of blood tests or x-rays done for another reason. <clears throat> now, pain in Paget's disease is the most common reason for patients attending their doctor. It can either be due to what we call metabolic activity of the Paget's disease or other causes. Now, pain due to metabolic activity usually responds to bisphosphonate treatment. However, other causes do not. And therefore, it's important to define the cause of the pain so uh, that doctors can give the correct treatment to their patients. No point in giving a treatment that's not going to work for the symptom. Now, <clears throat> I've shown this slide to really summarise the causes of pain. There are some causes of pain that are related to Paget's disease. I've already alluded to the fact that increased metabolic activity can be a cause of pain. Uh, usually patients with that have a raised alkaline phosphatase level or a raised ALP, and that often responds to bisphosphonate therapy. However, deformity of the bones can cause pain. That's clearly related to Paget's. If you have osteoarthritis around the joint, that's due to Paget's, that can cause pain. Things like fractures, Spinal stenosis, when the spinal cord uh, uh, gets uh, um, damaged or when the spinal cord actually gets um, compressed by pagetic tissue or, or nerve compression. Of course, there's lots of uh, causes of pain in people with pagets not related to pagets. For example, wear and tear in the discs, osteoarthritis in joints distant from where Paget involves, uh, fractures, fibromyalgia, so ligament strains, things like polymyalgia, things that can affect anyone whether or not they've got Paget's disease. <clears throat> now, a lot of causes of pain. There is also a lot of things that can make pain worse. And I'm sure many of the audience have experienced this. You know, if you're feeling anxious or depressed, that can make pain feel worse. If you're undergoing a traumatic life event, so can that. If there's physical or mental abuse or psychological stress, all of that can make perception of pain appear worse. And many of us, I think, have experienced that throughout our life. Now, here's some examples of causes of acute and chronic pain in Paget's. Well, on the left is the cause of acute pain. That's a fracture through a bone affected by Paget's disease. And this was a patient of mine when I was working in Aberdeen who suddenly uh, uh, was walking out of shop, heard a crack in her hip and developed sudden pain. And it was due to a fracture. Uh, chronic pain can be due to deformed bones as a result of Paget's disease, as shown on this slide, on the right-hand part, part of the slide, or osteoarthritis second to Paget's disease. So this is a hip joint affected by um, osteoarthritis and the rest of the pelvis is affected by Paget's disease. That's quite a common complication. <clears throat> now, we've been doing a study in Edinburgh funded by the Paget's Association called the PIP study, the pain in Paget's disease. And here I'm just showing some preliminary results looking at what the causes of pain were or the proportion of patients that had pain. So in fact, 
um, the, the most common cause of pain was osteoarthritis not related to Paget's disease. So patients had wear and tear in the joints, but not in a, a joint uh, near a bone that was affected. In about 13%, the cause of the pain was thought to be deformity of the bone. In 17%, so that's just less than one fifth, it was thought to be due to metabolic activity. And in 9%, it was thought to be due to OA related to Paget. So that's osteoarthritis next to an affected bone. Finally, uh, about one in five patients had no pain uh, at all. And we're analyzing, uh, we're continuing with this study and hope to have the results presented towards the end of next year. Now, I've mentioned metabolic activity uh, being a cause of pain, but in fact, many patients with increased metabolic activity don't have pain. And here I'm showing information from the PRISM study. <clears throat> and we divided patients into those with a high ALP, so that's increased metabolic activity, and a normal ALP. And the proportion of patients with pain is shown in red, with no pain is shown in green. And what you can see, high ALP, well, about 55% of patients had pain, but actually about 40% of patients with high ALP had no pain. So having metabolic activity doesn't mean you're gonna have pain. Conversely, about 50% of patients with normal ALP had pain. And we now know, uh, actually looking at those patients, it was mainly due to osteoarthritis. So again, emphasizing, that the pain in Paget's can have many different causes. <clears throat> now, there are various drug treatments we use for pain in Paget's disease. If it's acute pain, if you have a fracture, uh, you will need uh, analgesia or painkillers, often strong painkillers like opioids, anti-inflammatory drugs. Well, with cor chronic pain due to Paget's, bisphosphonates are commonly used, but as are analgesics and anti-inflammatory drugs and nerve blockers like gabapentin, amitriptyline, and, and duloxetine and so on and so forth. So there's quite a lot of treatments that can be used. If I just spend a moment on bisphosphonates, uh, as I mentioned, Professor Graham Russell is going to be talking in more detail about bisphosphonates. But this is a slide from a clinical trial in which Paget's was treated with bisphosphonates. And it was a study of Ian Reid um, from uh, New Zealand. And it was a follow-up study by David Hosking, who's a former chairman of the Paget's Association. So the initial study is on the left hand of the slide. Patients given the bisphosphonate residronate um, are shown in the red squares, zoledronic acid in the blue squares, and on the vertical axis is alkaline phosphatase levels. And what you can see is prior to starting treatment, the alkaline phosphatase levels or ALP levels were very high in both groups, but with the bisosinate, they went down pretty impressively, uh, both with resedronate and with zoledronic acid. In fact, zoledronic acid was significantly better than resedronate in helping the pain. Uh, the effect, this is 182 days, um, lasted for up to 24 months in this study with uh, zoledronic acid, tended to relapse a little bit with resedronate, uh, uh, but both of the drugs are very effective in treating metabolic activity in Paget's. When it came to pain, um, the effects were definitely there, although perhaps less impressive than the alkaline phosphatase level. I, I'm showing in this slide what's called data from SF36, it's a measure of quality of life. If the bars are going to the right hand side of this vertical line, that means it's a positive response. The bars that go to the left, that's a negative response. The thing I'd like you to focus on is with pain, bodily pain, both resedronate and zoledronic acid did have a positive effect uh, on pain. And that's a very important indication for treatment with bisphosphonates. <clears throat> Now, there's a curious thing about bisphosphonates and pain, and this was from a, a follow-up study, again by Ian Reid, um, who looked at the long-term effect of zoledronic acid and resedronate in pain. <clears throat> so what I'm showing here is the alkaline phosphatase again. This is the start of the study. And then the patients get followed up for many years, like up to 72 months. So that's almost six years. And what uh, uh, Reid and colleagues found was zoledronic acid, that's this line, the effect in the LP really persisted pretty well in those patients remaining out to five or more years with a slight relapse uh, with resedronate, although admittedly even resedronate was lasting quite a long time. The interesting thing was with zoledronic acid, even though the biochemistry, in other words, the ALP remained suppressed, about 10% of patients had what we call a clinical relapse. And so what I mean by that is 
their pain uh, worsened again, even though the biochemistry uh, was normal. And, and again, emphasizing the fact that pain in Paget's is a complex symptom. Now, what about non-drug treatments? I've, I've mainly focused on drug treatments, but there's a lot of stuff you can do that doesn't involve uh, drugs. There can be mindfulness, peer support, clinical psychology, occupational therapy, physiotherapy, things like TENS and acupuncture. And finally, surgery, for example, a joint replacement. And I'm not going to talk about that in detail uh, because Nav Makaram, uh, our orthopedic surgeon, uh, will cover that in his uh, talk. But just to mention, it's not just about bisphosphonates or medical treatments. There's a lot of other treatments that can be used. <clears throat> So one of the things that has been of interest to uh, people like myself working in the area of patches for years is should you try and treat the fact that patients have a high alkaline phosphatase level, even though they might not be having any symptoms, should you try and treat that? And um, I did a trial or me and my colleagues did a trial uh, a number of years ago, started in 2001, to ask the question, well, what if you try and treat a high alkaline phosphatase? Is that beneficial? So here's the timeline. The idea was developed in 1999. The trial was funded in 2000. First patient enrolled 2001, final visit in 2006. And it, it's the largest study ever done in Paget's disease involving many hospitals, many doctors and many nurses across the UK. And so what um, uh, the trial, uh, the PRISM trial stood for is Paget's disease, randomized trial of intensive versus symptomatic management. So we enrolled uh, 1,300 patients, 663 got symptomatic, 661 got intensive. And if it was symptomatic, we only gave treatment if there was bone pain, uh, whereas intensive, we, we treated the alkaline phosphatase. So in other words, we had treatment whether or not being bone pain was present. And I'm showing in this slide the effects of these two strategies on ALP or alkaline phosphatase. So what uh, we found was with intensive treatment, patients were given lots of bisphosphonates, the ALP fell. It fell a little in symptomatic because some got bisphosphonates, but slightly remained above average. <clears throat> when it turned to complications though and pain, there was really no uh, difference between the groups. So the uh, proportion with fractures was the same, about 7%. The proportion of patients requiring orthopedic surgery, again, was the same. Pagetic bone pain was the same, any bone pain, no effect on deafness and no effect on quality of life. So from this study, it did not look as though treating the alkaline phosphatase was any advantage over treating uh, symptoms if they were present. <clears throat> we did follow that up with uh, an extended study called PRISM Easy, and it was PRISM, uh, except we used zoledronic acid, which I've just mentioned in the last slide, it's a very potent bisphosphonate. So a similar design, fewer patients went into this, 502. And again, we either give symptomatic treatment only of bone pain or treated the alkaline phosphatase. And what that study showed is with regard to fracture, orthopedic surgery, there was no difference between the groups. And in fact, intensive treatments increased the risk of fracture by about 1.9 fold and surgery by 1.8 fold, although that wasn't significant. And we had more adverse events, SAEs, about 28% more. And there was these are the adverse events seen um, arrhythmia, non-union of fractures, subtrochanteric fractures. So having this intensive treatment really wasn't very uh, any beneficial really. And uh, there was really no benefit in terms of uh, a slight, a minimal benefit in terms of pain, but only at year two and not seen at the other years. So again, this really was the same as the PRISM study. Intensive treatment really is of no benefit. So that um, was uh, mentioned in the, the clinical guideline, which the association supported, published in 2019. We think that bisphosphonates are recommended for the treatment of bone pain and pagets with solidronic acid as the first choice. But we do not believe, or at least there's no evidence as yet, that giving bisphosphonates with the primary aim of suppressing ALP is of value. And so basically, the adage I use is treat the patient, not the ALP value. <clears throat> so, um, 
can we do better? Perhaps in patients in the PRISM study, it was too late. And uh, some of you know, we're doing another study just now called the ZIP study, in which we're looking at people uh, who are children of patients with Pagets who haven't yet been diagnosed Pagets, but who are genetically at risk of getting Pagets because they carry a, a gene mutation in a gene called sequestrosome 1. So this is the design of the ZIP study. We've enrolled people with a family history of Pagets who haven't developed Pagets. We genotype them for SQSTM1 and if they're positive, we allocate the people into getting zoledronic acid, the drug you've heard about, or placebo, and we're following them up. Now, this study should have ended in 2020, but COVID intervened. It should have ended in 2021, but we haven't quite managed there. But we think it, by the end of 2021, we will know the answer. And the question is, can we prevent Pagets by genetic te uh, testing? And it's a double, what's called a double blind trial. So some get dummies, some get the real stuff. We're looking at new Pagetic bone lesions, so-called, and we're looking at pain and quality of life and biochemistry. <clears throat> so I'm showing here um, the what the baseline characteristics of patient in the ZIP study look like. Uh, we enrolled 222 patients in total, slightly more women than men. The average age of participants was about 50. And in fact, about 9% of people had signs of early Paget's disease. But in fact, none of these people was symptomatic. None of them had any pain related to Paget's. And um, lesions were slightly more common in men um, and people with lesions were slightly older than those with no lesions. So the ZIP study is going to be an interesting study um, and we will know then if treating patients early on uh, with bisphosphonate is going to be of clinical value, although we don't know it yet. So watch this space. <clears throat> so in summary, um, there's many causes of pain in Paget's disease. Uh, you, if you've got Paget's disease, you have to be carefully evaluated by the doctor that you see uh, to determine if the pain is due to the Paget's disease or another cause. And if it is, then bisphosphonates can really help that pain. Um, at the moment, we do not advise uh, just treating the ALP just because it's high. So if someone, uh, if a doctor advises that, I think you have to ask, well, is it going to do me any good uh, if you have no symptoms? And finally, uh, but it is a, a task for the future, is possible that early intervention with those at risk of Paget's disease may hold the key to preventing complications because they do still occur. And the ZIP study will hopefully um, help to answer that. So I hope you found that interesting. Unfortunately, there may not be uh, time for questions at the end of this uh, video presentation, but uh, you never know, we might organize a QA session with the speakers of uh, the Information Day uh, if, if members of the association would find that useful. Thank you.